A faith that works. He's wondering about that right now. <laughs> a faith that works. We, we're looking at the little book of James. And in the book of James, he, he's, he's developing a faith that works. Uh, it's not so much that you say you have faith, uh, you've got to actually practice your faith. And uh, today we're going to focus in on a faith that works when you don't seem to measure up. You know, we went to the amusement park several years ago with our grandkids, and the one was tall enough for the rides and was elated. The one that was not tall enough for the rides was very disappointed. Ever been there? Is something like that? Yeah, it just didn't quite measure up <clears throat> to be a part of all the fun. Sometimes, spiritually, we don't feel like we measure up. Sometimes, it comes from the direction of inwardly. Inwardly, I just don't feel like I measure up. Sometimes, it's outwardly. You know, there's things and circumstances and I, in my world, and I, I feel like I just don't measure up to the occasion that's at hand the task. I just don't measure up. Sometimes it's upwardly. In fact, this is quite frequent. <laughs> that I just don't measure up. You know, Jesus put up the bar really high. Did you ever notice that? Matthew chapter 5 verse 48, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. How many perfect people here? <laughs> All right, I, I, that's what I thought. You notice my hand didn't even go up. I, it's, <laughs> nope, it didn't go up. No, no perfect people here. All right. So uh, what we have here is, in, in the, our discussion of James here, he's going to focus on when you don't seem to measure up, and I want to start with the one inwardly. The first thing he said, when you don't feel like you measure up inwardly, he said, open your ears. Our tendency is to open our mouths. But he says, open your ears. Dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. I'm more often quick to complain, to bellyache, to get angry or frustrated. But he says the first thing we need to do is just listen. My wife will say to me, you're not listening to me. Well, I'm hearing the words. What she means is I'm not hearkening unto her. I'm not doing it her way. I'll say, yeah, I heard exactly what you said. I'm just going to do it my way, <laughs> right? And, and the whole idea here is listen is more than just, okay, I heard it, but I hearken unto it. I do it. I listen, not so that I can justify my position, and, but that I'm actually listening to hearken. The second thing he says is you've got to hold your tongue. This is the hard one, slow to speak. Sometimes my, my lips are moving so fast that I can't hear a thing that anybody is saying. I, I want to express myself rather than just be patient and be slow to speak. And then I say things that later I regret. If it's an external circumstance inward, I'm boiling inside, so I lash out and I blow up like a volcano. I'm angry at everybody and angry at everything. And then later I regret that I wasn't holding my tongue. I wasn't slow to speak. Third one is you need to calm your temper and slow to become angry. I love this verse. First of all, this is a, a command that's saying, you know, people say to me, I just can't control my anger. But God is saying, oh, yes, you can. And I shared this a few weeks ago. You get really upset with the kids and you're screaming and hollering at them and the phone rings and you pick it up instead of hollering and screaming at the person on the end you say hello <laughs> why because you've got complete control over your emotions your anger and so he says here listen quick to listen slow to speak so you can choose your words wisely and very slow to become angry control your temper. Why? Why would I want to control my temper? Here's why, he says. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. God expects us to live a righteous life. And there is a place for anger. There is. Jesus got angry when they made the Father's house, a, the, the temple, a place of merchandise. 
He made a whip. He drove out the money changers and all the animals. He said, my, my father's house is to be a house of prayer and not a place of business. And, and he cleansed the temple. In fact, he did it two times in the Gospel of Mark. It says at one place, Jesus gave them an angry look. I'll tell you what that angry look is. I'm a young pastor. I got kids. My wife's not with me. They're sitting in the pew. I'm speaking and they're misbehaving. I just give them that look. It's the look they know they are. They're in big trouble. You know the look? Some of you have gotten the look. Some of you have given the look. You see, there's a place for anger, but this is what the text is saying. You control it. And Jesus, is, Jesus controlled it. He didn't blow up on the people. He solved the problem. He got re all that adrenaline rush that comes with your anger, that, that extra surge of energy is a God-given surge of energy. But rather than focusing on blowing up on people, he solved the problem. He got the money changers out of there. That solved the problem. He gave a firm, stern look that solved the problem. And that's what we got to do. We, you see, man's anger blows up. It gets bitter. There's resentment, which means whatever you sent to me, I'm sending right back. That kind of anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And so I need to be controlling my emotions from within. When I don't feel like I'm measuring up within, I need to get a hold of my emotions and control them. Fourth thing, he says, is purge your filth. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth. Morality. Something really missing in our culture today. From the simplest things of telling the truth to some of the bigger things like sexual immorality of all sorts and kinds. He says, whoa, 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 if you feel like you're not measuring up within, look to see if there's any filth or decay on the inside or the evil that is so prevalent in the world and in our culture. Check yourself out. Look inside. What's in there? What's in there? Imagine going to the dentist. I visited the dentist this week. He says, you got a cavity. He told me I had a cavity. Well, in order to get the cavity, he's got to get the drill out. In order to drill, oh, I stop and say, whoa, that hurts. Hey, just leave the cavity in there. Just fill the tooth. So what happens? It continues to grow. Here's the problem that I had. They already fixed the tooth. They got rid of the cavity, and they put a crown on. And then, over the years, the crown really wasn't seated correctly. So it got a cavity underneath the crown. So now they got to take the crown off to get to the cavity to put another crown on. You see, when I leave the filth in there, when I leave the crud in my life, when I leave the crud in my tooth, it will resurface. What he's saying here is you get the, get the filth out and then you need to seal that up so the filth doesn't get back in. Because when you feel like you don't measure up inside, somewhere along the line you're going to find there's probably some crud in there that you need to get out. That you need to get out. You need to get out. Fifth thing he says is accept his word. And humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Jesus told the parable. It was a parable about the sower. Matthew 13. The sower went out to sow. And the way he sowed, he had all the, the seed that it, as he's farming, he already tilled the ground up and turned it over so he could throw the seed. And, and they didn't do it like we do today. for the seed every so often. They scattered the seed. Man, they're just throwing the seed out there. It's landing, and you know some's going to take, and some probably won't. And, and he talks about different kinds of soils on which the seed lands. And he said there's the, the hard-beaten path where everybody walks. 
and the seed just lays on there and the birds come along easy target go down swoop down snatch that that seed and away they go with the seed uh, another soil is a rocky soil and the rocky soil because there's no depth in that soil he says it, it's, it falls in between the, the, the rocks and it's it's kind of like the grass that grows between the cracks in your sidewalk. It seems like you can't get rid of it. But anyway, it falls there and it says, it comes up, but it's in the Middle East. He says, because there's no depth, the sun scorches it. It withers up and it dies. And, and he, he's talking about the different soils. He says, then there's another one that falls on the ground and then it, it, there's weeds in the area. And as it grows up, the weeds choke it out and kill it. And then he says, oh, there's the seed that falls on the good soil. And the good soil produces a hundredfold. You get this great crop. And what he's really talking about, he says, now the seed is the word of God. He says, the, when a bird comes, that's, that's Satan the devil. And he comes in, he snatches the word, the word away from a person so they won't believe. And some of, some of it's like the seed that falls in, in the cracks and it grows up quickly and and then the sun and the east wind comes and scorches it. It says it, it pops up with joy, but there's no root or depth. It's all an emotional experience, no intellectual uh, or commitment experience. Just, wow, this is fun. This is great. And it doesn't last. He says, but then there was the one where the word took the seed that was planted in the soil of a heart. It took root and it brings forth a hundredfold. It produces and reproduces. It's the word of God. I notice in a text he says, and humbly accept the word that was planted in you. He's assuming you're the good soil. You accept that, and it says then, which can save you? The word can is the word dunamis, which means uh, we get the word dynamite from that. He's saying this word is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. This word that's planted in you is power to save. That's probably the best translation. It's the power to save you. You have to receive the message of the word as they did in Acts. You receive the word. You're added unto the flock of God. It has the power to save you. That was inwardly. I've got to allow the word of God to do its work by purging the filth and all those things we just covered. I've got to be hold my tongue, quick to listen, slow to speak, and guarding my heart. Why do I do that? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so I've got to get the word in there. I've got to get the word inside. Some pressures come outwardly. And to that he says, just do it. Don't merely listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Just do it. Just do it. Yeah, but I don't feel like it. Well, just do it anyway. Most of the time you don't feel like doing it. You just do it anyway. Because God said to do it. He says anyone who actually listens to the word but he does not do what it says. He's like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. Okay, I looked at my face and I thought, ooh, you know, what a mess. All right, I, I haven't shaved. I got up in the morning. The way I sleep, my hair stands straight up on end almost every morning. And, and I, I, oh, it doesn't even look, it doesn't even look. Who is this guy in the mirror, right? He says, and so as I step away, I don't do anything about it. He looks at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. He's a mess. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do, to do this, the word, not forgetting what he has heard when he got in the word, God spoke to your heart and you don't walk away and say, oh, that's, well, that was really wonderful. Now I go just live however I want to live. But he does the word. He will be blessed whenever he does. Now notice what the word is. The word is the perfect law that gives liberty. This takes us back to a few weeks ago. Does the law of the track, remember when we talked about the law of the track? There's the railroad tracks. Do they limit or free you? When you've got a track in your life and you're on this track, does it limit or free you? I mean, I'm asking, 
is the train most free when it's on the tracks or when the train is off the tracks? Of course, it's when I'm on the track. And, and the Word of God is like the tracks, the Ten Commandments, you know, the two tablets, the Word of God, the will of God. And what I have is I got these rails. And, and when I'm on the rails and I'm doing the Word, I'm most free in my life because God gave me the Word to free me so that Jesus said, you, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. I have the fullest life when I'm on track with God. In fact, when somebody's life is off track, we say their life's a train wreck. Their life's a train wreck. It's the perfect law of liberty. He's saying, just do what God says. So he says, I am most free when I just do what God says. Why? Because he will bless the man who does it. He will be blessed in what he does. So you got all these outward circumstances going on. He says, no, just do the word. Just do it. See if I won't bless you. See if I won't bless you. Third one is upwardly. Upwardly has to do with our religion. Our religion. First thing he says, when it comes to religion, it comes back to this tongue. In fact, he's going to talk about tongue even more later in the book. The tongue. Somebody said the uh, that guns are the, the second most lethal weapon. The first being the tongue. He says, control your tongue. If anyone considers himself religious. Now, the term religious means that you're God-fearing in your worship. <clears throat> you really fear God in your worship. He says, if anyone consider himself to be a real God-fearing, worshiping kind of person, and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, I got this guy taped up. I should have put a bridle in his mouth. <laughs> Because that's literally what it is. You've got a bridle to control it. He says he does not keep a, a, a tight rein on his t- tongue. He deceives himself. And his worship is worthless. All his God-fearing, worshipful things that he does, the word worthless is zero. It's empty. It's nothing. God really wants us to control this thing right here. Right here. He wants us to control it. He says, if you're going to have good worship with God upwardly, and feel like you measure up all places, you start with your tongue. Second thing he says here, because that's to love the Lord your God with all your heart. The second was, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, look after the less fortunate. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this. To look over or look after orphans and widows in their distress. Here we got the widow with her son and here we got the orphan. It is not our government's responsibility according to the the word of God to take care of all of them. They're to protect us and a lot of other things but we as a community of believers are to be looking out and caring for those who are in need. When I am truly religious, my faith will impact other people less fortunate than I. It's interesting that in Ephesians when it says, let him who stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands. Why? So he's not a thief? No, 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 no so that he may be able to help those who are in time of need. You see, God gave me what I have so I wouldn't just hoard it to myself, but when I see people in need, that I would reach out and help meet that need. I'm thrilled by all the outreaches that we have here into our community. We as a people gather together and we collect for Open Door, for Cross Street Ministries, for different things. That's, that's what he's talking about. I don't just live for myself. When I start touching other people's lives, there's something that just happens upwardly between me and God because God wants me to love him most and love my neighbor as myself. And he begins to work in my life. Finally, he says, keep yourself pure. To keep oneself from being polluted by the world. 
I am in the world, according to Jesus, but I am not of the world. I'm just sojourning through this. Uh, and so um, I'm like Abraham, who's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Uh, I'm just, I'm a pilgrim on a journey through this life. I'm not to... I'm not to let the world's pollutions to influence me. I'm not to allow the world, as in Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, put me into its mold. I'm not to be a blob of jello. You know how jello works? You get a mold, you mix up your jello, you put it in, put it in the fridge, and you cool it, you take it out of the mold, and it looks just like the mold. I am not to be in the mold of the world. I am in to be in the mold of Christ and to be an image bearer of Jesus Christ being transformed by my mind and I'm to have pure religion before God by not being pushed into the mold of the world. I am to live a countercultural life. I don't go with the grain of my culture. I stand pretty much against the grain. They're on the broad path. I'm on the narrow path. Theirs leads to destruction. Mine leads to eternal life. I'm out there preaching a message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. And they're out there saying, oh, there's many ways. I, I'm totally contrary in everything. I can't let them force me into their political correctness mold. I'm in the biblical correctness mold. The perfect law of liberty. This is what I want you to take with you today. We need to get into the word. We need to get into the word the perfect law of liberty and we have got to allow the word to get into us it's got to become part of us in us one of my favorite uh, Bible preachers was telling the story he said just pretend with me pretend that I'm not the pastor but pretend that I'm the executive of a really thriving company and uh, our sales are going through the roof and I've decided I'm going to start one in Europe and I go to, I'm going to go to Europe and be gone for about eight months to get it established from the ground up and get our, our program there and I put you in charge of the office here in the States while I'm gone. And while you're in the office at, in the States while I'm gone, I'll be in contact with you, I'll be sending you letters, I laid out a whole plan of what to do and I go off for eight months and I finally come back. As I come back to the office, first thing I see is outside, there's weeds everywhere, broken window, and I'm thinking, boy, they sure let this place go while I was gone. I go in and the receptionist is there, she's got a coffee and she's got some bubble gum and, and she's doing a crossword puzzle while she's watching on her monitor a, day, a, 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 a soap opera. And I said, what's going on here? She said, well, I don't know. And I ask about the person I left in charge and, and, uh, and they say, somebody down the hall says, oh, he's in his office. So I go down, as I get to the office there, I see, as I'm passing by, a whole group of people in the breakout room, and they're playing Wii Bowling. And I'm thinking, there's trash everywhere. Trash is overflowing the cans, and I go in, and I finally find you, and I say, hey, what's going on here? I left you in charge. I wrote you my letters. Didn't you get my letters? Didn't you get my... And you say, oh, yeah. Oh, those were good letters. In fact, they were so good... Every Friday, the whole company would get together, we'd read them, and we'd study them. Some of us even memorized some lines from them. In fact, hey, you know Shirley? She memorized one of your letters completely. And I said, but you didn't do them. And he said, well, of course we didn't do them. He said, what am I talking about here? I've got the Word of God. It's God's letter. To me, I read it, I study it, I memorize parts of it, perhaps large parts of it. The question here in James is, am I doing it? Am I doing it? Am I doing it? We get the word in us, especially when we don't feel like we measure up. As soon as I get into the word and I do it, God will make me feel so much better about myself because I'm a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Why? Because accepting his word in your life does three things. When you accept the word, it saves you. It frees you. It frees you. Finally, he said, 
God will bless you. Isn't that what you want? God's blessing. I say, let the word get in you and then do it. Just do it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for James' admonition to us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. To practice it, not just hear it. To be on the front line of doing, not just in some study hall, learning. Get us out of our pews and into the streets. Get the word out of our hearts and through our mouths to those that we know. Lord, we pray that through our witness, many will come to know Jesus as Savior. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.